How's it going, everyone? Today I interview Brian Chow, who is a spay casting instructor, spay line technician, and all around steelhead expert. We talk about real line balance, pairing your line with your rod, and fishing with intention. Don't miss this one as Brian talks about the karma jar and how he communicates with Canadian geese while fishing. Without further ado, here's Brian Chow. How's it going, Brian? Great, Dave. How are you doing today? Good, good, good to good to have you on here. I've uh, I've got a bunch of questions here. Um, a lot of them are around steelhead fly fishing and spay lines and spay casting because I think that's a uh, definitely um, you know it's something that has allowed a lot of new steelheaders to get into fishing, but I think it's also a you know, a point of struggle sometimes get into some of this. So I'm hoping you can kind of clarify some of these uh, questions we have. Does that, does that sound good to you? Absolutely. Always willing to help. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So uh, uh, kind of just getting started here, maybe you can uh, talk a little bit about where you came from, how you got into fly fishing and steelhead fishing and, you know, how you became um, basically an expert in, in the whole everything spay casting. <laughs> <laughs> well, Yeah. Well, th- thank you for the kind words. I, um, I, I would say, you know, fly fishing was, I, I feel like it was just one of those things that I've, I was directed towards, if you will. Um, I, I just, I met, I met somebody who happened to fly fish. I've been fishing really most of my life conventionally um, as a child. Um, I grew up uh, in the Northwest, Bremerton area. And I remember the very first time that I guess that, that the intention decision-making of fishing actually started clicking in my head that I think I must've been like five or six. And I I was on the the Bremerton pier with my family and we were out there just, uh, you know, soaking bait for, for whatever was in the water at the Mm -hmm. time. (laughs) Perch (laughs) in this case. Um, but, uh, we weren't catching anything and, uh, the guy next to us was catching them all. (laughs) And I, I remember, uh, walking over to him and, gathering up the courage and just asking, you know, do you mind if I ask what you're doing? And he smiled and, and showed me. And the secret at that point was sand shrimp. Hmm. And so yep. I, I remember that first gear turning, thinking, okay, so it does in fact matter. <laughs> and so he gave me a couple and you know, lo and behold, it worked. And so from that point forward, I think the, you know, the mindset, the mindset of fishing started, started manifesting itself into, you know, really every, everything that I did. And eventually led me to the pursuit of, of fly fishing, which, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think that I, I took I took interest in it um, because of all the, you know, all the little things that fly fishing involves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I, I liked the detail. I liked the cast. I liked the purity of it. Mm-hmm. Um, the the intimate up close encounter with with natural uh, with the na- with nature and, you know, being in the water. Um, and being uh, learning how to communicate with fish in their native environments and trying to trying to communicate with you know masters of their environment. Mm-hmm. So you know to kind of fast forward through how steelheading ended up, um, I guess finding its way into my repertoire was you know I, I guided as a trout guide in college and mm-hmm. after college as well, and that was definitely fun. But you know through a series of just work moves, I ended up uh, in in Portland. I started in Seattle, and that's where I started a okay. lot of my steelheading with up in the S rivers, you know, uh, Skagit, Skykomish, Snoqualmie, Sauk. Um, it, it, that was where I started. That was where I, I had uh, picked up a two-handed rod and just started swinging flies. Mm-hmm. There was a new attraction to this this kind of casting, um, and I would say that was, you know, that was right around 2000, you know, okay. right around there. So... Um, I, you know, started learning up there. Work moved me down to Portland. Um, and so I got to know a lot of the Portland fisheries. And really, out of geographic location, I, I became a steelheader. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there's just, there's not that many close trout fisheries in the Portland area. Sure, there's a few, but there's certainly a lot more steelhead that swim around the city of Portland than wild trout. Yeah. And, um, you know, the anadromous species became um, attractive to me because I could get out before work, after work. I remember numerous times in my scrubs because I worked at the hospital. I would have scrubs underneath oh, yeah. my waiters for a call from the front desk okay. saying, OK, you got to be here, hopping in my car and taking the waiters off and running to the hospital. <laughs> awesome. 
So I, I would say hours in the saddle came just by squeezing them in here and there, mm-hmm. you know, getting out on the weekends when I could with my buddies and, um, and just learning whatever I could about trying to get a pulse on a game that has very few data points. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So, so you basically kind of dove right into it and got into kind of spade casting and all that, um, as that uh, developed and then you basically <clears throat> have done it ever since. I mean, how did you get into like, I mean, as far as being a, you know, looking at spay lines and things like that. And I know you've done some work with uh, up on the click a tad and you've done the spay clave up there. How did all that develop? Did you just kind of just found yourself in the middle of that? Or maybe you can clarify where you came from there. Well, I, I, I laugh about how there's, I, I don't believe really in any coincidences anymore. And, and so I feel that my my profession as a as a medical device rep, I I was trained to be able to, um, I guess, communicate communicate in in an environment in which I had to learn to conceptualize. Um, what I did was I helped um, orthopedic and neurosurgeons through through spine surgery mm-hmm. without ever having touching the patient. Wow. So I, you know, being the consultant for my tinker toys, if you will, those were my you know my titanium and carbon fiber implants. Mm-hmm. Um, I had to learn to educate surgeons before and during and after surgery on a surgical procedure that I had never done. Wow. So, (laughs) but what I did know was I knew the ins and outs of my toys and how to troubleshoot my toys and, and also how to, how to instruct and how to conceptualize. So that skill set I feel translated eventually into how to conceptualize lines that I would, you know, I would, I would touch a line, I'd see what it did. And then I would try to figure out how to make it better. Hmm. And, you know, that was, that's, that is, that's a trait that started back when I was a kid, when I would disassemble my parents' stereo systems to figure (laughs) out how to get more bass out of an eight inch home audio. Right. That's cool. (laughs) So, so, you know, so that I, I remember miking out like when I was hmm. uh, when I was shown a um, uh, you know uh, just a basic ruler and a micrometer and graphing paper I, I remember going to the arts and crafts store and figuring out you know I want to see why this line either takes so long to turn over or is hard to pull out of the water mm-hmm. and the why really was what fueled my delving into and stay literally staying up late at nights just keeping me up trying to figure out why hmm. something did what it did. Well, yeah. So you've had a, a lot of, I mean, since you first got into it, I mean, obviously there's been a lot of changes in lines and things like that. What do you, what do you think is the biggest change from, you know, when you first got started till, you know, today with, with all the different lines? Oh my God. The, the learning curve for the beginning angler has just skyrocketed as a result of shorter heads. Yep. And I can't tell you the number of older anglers that I've spoken to that didn't even know that they could strip that whatever mark was in an integrated line <laughs> into their hands. Like they thought right. that they needed to throw whatever amount of head length that the box said it had from that black marker and only from that back black marker. <laughs> And, you know, to me, it was just like, well, what is that marker there for? You know, pull it in. It's a marker. Yeah. You know, it tells you where you're at, but it does not by any means dictate that you have to do things a particular way. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I remember just experimenting with that mentality that, you know, you work with what you got till you get what you want. And, you know, with shooting heads and, you know, obviously the introduction of Skagit heads, man, I mean, I remember the very first cast I threw with a Skagit head thinking, what have I been wasting my time doing <laughs> for the first five years? Yeah. And you know, it's, it wasn't, it wasn't, I, I think I remember rephrasing that in my head thinking, okay, maybe I didn't waste this time. Maybe this was technique that I learned and I can apply this mm-hmm. to this and, and then move forward. But, but then I saw how, when I handed it to my friends who had never picked up, uh, you know, a spay rod, my wife specifically, mm-hmm. you know, back, that was back when I could actually teach my wife anything. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, when she first picked it up, she all of a sudden got to a point of proficiency much sooner. Huh. And then the light bulb went off and said, OK, well, you know, maybe there's there's I guess, you know, technology and, and line development is really taking a turn here that the learning curve has really taken a, a change. And so then I started I, I mic'd it out. I wanted to know 
why a particular line did this. And I think that the advent of the shorter head has has definitely helped the majority of anglers getting into the sport Mm -hmm. become proficient. And I mean, we'll just say find data points and actually get their fly in the water versus in the air or tangled up. Yep. Uh, So that's that I feel is what has definitely helped anglers nowadays is it has just gotten their flies in the water more. Yep. Yep, exactly. And that's, that's kind of where, you know, I coming from, you know, single handed rods, you know, like a lot of people, I mean, that was the first thing you realize you're like, you know, with the spay rod, you're just fishing more, your lines, your flies in the water more. And you're because of that, you're catching more fish. But, um, yeah, no, that is a great point. I, I, uh, you know, thinking about actual, the lines, can you break down maybe for, you know, somebody who's new to all of this, as far as the spay lines and, you know, what they need to know to get started, say, if they're going in for winter steelhead somewhere, is it, you know, is this pretty simple? Can you, or is there some, a little bit of background they should know? Oh man. Well, <laughs> if they are starting swinging flies for winter steelhead, boy, they've climbed, they, they've chosen a very tall tree to climb for starters. Yeah. Well, uh, I, and I'm thinking more, a lot of the people I talk to are people that, you know, I've been fly fishing, but well, I talked to somebody just this week and they're down in Southern California and, you know, they've been reading and setting up. They never, never steelhead fish before, but they want to do it someday. And, uh, you know, and he was talking about, okay, so, you know, what do I need to know when I, to get ready sort of thing? So maybe that would be a little bit better. Somebody's got experience probably with a single handed cast, but wants to get into, you know, spay fishing or just steelhead fishing. You know, I would say that that comprises of 90% of the students that I, that I, uh, that I get, mm-hmm. um, whether it be from referral that have reached out to me, um, and, and whatnot is I find that most people have picked up a single hander are familiar with, you know, the nine foot five weight game and, yep. you know, some nine foot eight weight game. And, um, they want to be able to diversify their, I guess their angling time mm-hmm. on the water. And, you know, they live here in Portland or just moved here and they see, this spay casting thing. And I would say that with all the information on the internet available, it has easily gotten these, uh, these students to a point of frustration. Exactly. Before they have even picked up a rod. Yep. It's like they come at me with all this information that I, you know, especially in their position, I had no idea. It was, <laughs> it was beyond, my comprehension that there was even, you know, they, it just wasn't available at the time, but I can't even imagine what it must be like to have all this information and no time in the saddle. Right. Yeah. That's so good. Yeah. So my, my number one first suggestion is get a setup that you, that works mm-hmm. and stick with it Yeah. and, and stick with it. And uh, I guess resist the temptation to go buy something new because in this day and age, it's so easy to acquire hmm. that, um, you know, that just to to get a setup, let me take a look at whether or not this setup is going to help you or, or, or not help you and 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 just stick with the fundamentals. I mean, John, John Wooden, you know, the old Wizard yep. of West oh, yeah. basketball coach, right? I mean, that was his thing was learn how to put your socks on in the morning. <laughs> And, you know, that was it was a basic fundamental thing. And so with with learning how to spay cast, I would definitely say, you know, fine. Tell me where you're fishing first. Let me let me know where you want. Where is your closest piece of moving water or non moving water in some cases? Right. Um, But let's work with that. Tell me where you want to fish. Tell me the experience that you want out of fishing. And then let's get a setup and stick with it. And don't worry about all the other information except to get out there and just keep practicing. Mm-hmm. Okay. So there's no, yeah, I mean, that's thing. There's, there's so many different lines and it really depends on what you're doing. So if, if somebody, for example, was going to fish the, um, you know, say the Nehalem, you know, looking at the, the, around the Portland area and kind of a bigger river and swinging, um, you know, what sort of a, is there a line that you would recommend for that or a, a size of rod, um, kind of a setup to get into? Absolutely. I'm assuming you're you're referring to the main stem, not the north fork. Yeah, right? the main stem. Yep. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, main stem. I, I, I that is a great place. And you know, when I moved to Portland, it was one of the first places I explored because you know it was a bigger river. It was a, it was a size of a river that I was more used to. 
um, you know, coming from the S rivers of up north. Oh, right. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't fish the Nehalem in the summer. I just, you know, I would say my draw came in the winter for, you know, for obvious reasons that there's more water in the river. Um, but uh, the main stem Nehalem, I remember it. 13 foot was perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, 13 foot was fine. You could go to 13, six. Um, but you know, I'm going through a couple of the runs in my head. I mean, if you start heading upstream, you don't need anything more than a 13 foot rod. You can cover most of the river. Um, and I would say if you had a, you know, some kind of a Skagit head, you know, 13 foot seven weight yep. with a five ten Skagit head, you know, that is the, <laughs> yep. that is the most, most bought spay rod is setup. It? Okay. In Pacific Northwest. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the one. And, you know, in, in, in working with line design and just rod design, I always take a look at relevant data points that what is a number one sold skew in fly lines, in yeah. spay lines. And, it, it, you know, it was between a 510 and 540 hmm. Skagit head. Mm -hmm. And and so what that told me is that people were looking for seven weight rods. And by line design, most of those lines fit a 13-foot rod very nicely. So, you know, 13-foot seven, 510, some kind of a Skagit head, I don't really care. Yep. Um, but, uh, you know, a slew of sink tips, not too many, like three different sink tips. Yep. And and whatever fly brings you confidence. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you, you have a, a couple of flies that... Uh... One of them is uh, after the uh, is the after the trailblazers. Is that is that uh, one of them or? Yeah. 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 That, that's I would say that is more of a, you know, a clear condition fly. I don't like yeah. to use the words necessarily summer or winter because, yeah. I mean, I've got fish in the wintertime sure. when it's low and clear. Just the red. Um, just the overall more red is more of a clear, clear water. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. It, yeah. And that was it's a red and black. And, you know, I, I I've been inspired by uh, by the red wing blackbird, you know, an old yep. school pattern. And, you know, that pattern just kind of evolved into you know, adding a couple things here and there. And, you know, being in Portland and being a uh, Blazers fan, I just figured, yep. hey, you know, Rip City, shoot. And then, you know, then it gets completely ripped out of your hands. Yeah, that's right. Shoot sometime and the name kind of is cemented that, itself. Is, that, is, the, is it the, uh, the Rip City? Yes. Nice, nice. Yeah, and the, uh, I guess the, um, the Blackbird, the Red Wing Blackbird, that's Lonnie Waller's pattern, right? Yes, yeah. that's an old – I love the color – um, just the red black, you know, yeah. uh, that, that contrast to me is, I would say that in, you know, without going too far into fly design yeah. yet, but contrast is one of my primary uh, decision making factors, mm -hmm. I guess, is that, you know, sure. I, I, maybe we could attribute this to a you know, lack of focus that I had as a kid, but, um, I, <laughs> I, I like contrast when I can tie with different colors. I can, it shows up nicely. Um, you know, it just gives me confidence in yeah. short. Yeah, definitely. No, that's cool. Um, so yeah, I'll definitely, uh, some of these, uh, links and flies and things I'll, I'll post, uh, in the show notes just so everybody can take a look and they can see what we're talking about here. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about casting instruction. Do you do, um, any casting instruction lessons or guiding now? I think you mentioned you did some trout guiding. Do you still do that for steelhead now? Uh, guiding, no, I, I don't, uh, w with a six year old daughter, I just, you know, I, yeah. my time and uh, my time commitments have changed. We'll just say, yep. um, <laughs> and, um, I, I would say that, uh, my focus has then become more of instruction because that was really my favorite part of just personal interaction, whether it be guiding or taking friends out. It was that it was the awakening of that light bulb when people would learn something because I knew what it felt like for me that to be able to see someone light up over something that they're learning yeah. and be with the ability to apply it, you know, and that, that's, that's what does it for me. You know, when I can help inspire others to get out there and experience and, you know, eventually appreciate what it is that I see. Um, so yeah, casting instruction is great because it, you know, like, like this, uh, you know, like this interview that we set up, it works nicely into a kindergarten schedule. Yeah. That, you know, I drop her <laughs> off at seven yeah. 30, I pick her up at two. Yeah. I, you know, I've got some free time that I can dedicate, you know, a couple hours here and there. And oftentimes that's what I offer. I offer one hour or two hours. Okay. And I, I got to say, like, I, I have yet to do a one hour session because of how fast it goes. Yeah. And, you know, the two hour session, especially because, you know, with two hands there's, or two with a two handed rod, there's two hands involved. So, you know, we'll work with casts from with both hands on top. And that is something that I, you know, I'm very, 
um, very, it is very important. And in, in my instruction is that I, with a two handed rod, let's use both hands. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, obviously there's benefits to both, um, off shoulder casting, but I want people to learn with both their hands on top so that for me, honestly, it just helps the brain. Mm. It, it helps the learning process and, and doesn't build up these fake walls that we, you know, we put up and say, I can't learn how to do this for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. Oh, cool. Cool. Um, can you explain a little more on just, um, you know, the spade cast in, in general? I, I, I heard, um, I was talking to Pete Humphreys, um, you know, mm-hmm. last week or a little while ago and, he did a really good job of kind of, you know, we're doing it this audio without the video here, so um, it's not really easy to do. But can you explain just kind of the basics of the cast, like, I don't know, if where it starts or maybe even get into some some things you see that people struggle with a lot? No, this is this is a funny question because I can't tell you the number of conversations I've been in over the phone trying to teach someone. Yeah. Like, it's mostly a friend of mine right. that oh, lives a couple hours away. Yeah, you know, trying to explain why they can't get their fly out cast over the phone is yeah. impossible. And, and I gotta say, though, <laughs> well, not necessarily, but I would say that it just poses a different challenge of communication. Which you know, as you're hearing, kind of a thread here is that is that's just one of those things that I, I just don't want to see this generation forget. Man, yeah. is how to communicate. Right, <laughs> like, that's true. Person, like, over the phone, in person, whatever, but not just over text message. Right, so. Um, which is a whole nother challenge right there, trying to teach somebody how to spay cast with over text messages. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> but no, no way. <laughs> um, but I, I would say that to get into spay casting, I feel like my buddy Matt talks about this too, that um, he's over in Montana. Mm. And we, we laugh about how a spay rod doesn't know that it's a spay rod. <laughs> and, you know, a single hand rod doesn't know it's a single hand rod. They're just they're levers yeah. that bend when we ask them to bend, and so I, I I ask that people just remember that in the process of a spay cast that what we're learning is just physics, mm. and you know to a physics nerd myself, I, I want people to understand the fundamentals again that you know let's talk about a roll cast. Yeah. What is a roll cast and why does it work? You know. Right. Um, that when you aerialize a you know an overhead cast versus allowing the water to hold on to a roll cast and utilize that water tension to our benefit, what happens? So I always start with, you know, without going into the names and the motions, um, sure, maybe, you know, maybe that's why I take a little bit longer with my students. But I find that in the long run, that it enhances our ability to communicate and troubleshoot for my students that have, you know, that are further along, that I can literally refer back to basic physics and they can make the correction. Hmm. So, I mean, I, I've always felt that my, my most memorable instructors and professors have never told me what to do, but they've asked me so that I can answer my own questions. And at that point I feel as if it, you know, it awakens a different form of learning such that, you know, just like the left hand on top, it's like, I'm not left-handed. Well, then this will work out perfectly well because your right hand's actually doing the work. <laughs> yep. I, I, I get that a lot. And, <laughs> and so, um, when, when, when I feel that you awaken a student's ability to learn, then it really is in both parties, better interest. And, you know, I, I enjoy doing that. So again, to answer your question, I think it starts with the fundamentals. I always start with a roll cast mm-hmm. and then we explain why a roll cast works. And then we move to, you know, a, a turbocharged roll cast. People call it a switch cast. You know, the importance of anchor placement. Your anchor, I mean, if you got your anchor in the wrong place, yeah. go ahead and you try. Maybe it'll work. Right. But, um, but you know, it'll work as a result of some bad habits that are, you know, uh, that, are, that manifest themselves as a result of, you know, compensating for something. So, um, you know, I... It's, it's hard for me to answer your question in, yeah. in I guess, the third sense of how do you explain a spay cast. But, again, fundamentals, start with the physics. Understand mm-hmm. why something works. And of all things, understand why you have the setup that you have in your hands. You know, let's talk a little bit about what what this line does best so that you can understand, you know, how to fish most effectively. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's what people ask me a lot of when they – when they're in a, when they hire me as a, as an instructor, 
you know, I, I, I often find what is it that you want? You know, I always ask, what would you like to get out of this? And oftentimes the answer is, you know, some form of I want to be able to feel better when I'm fishing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's not it's not necessarily probably all the time that I want to be able to cast further, but I just want to be able to have that cast go out there like I would like it a little more often then yes you know and, that's it yeah yeah and, and and how do i enjoy my time on the yeah. water yeah yeah and it, that's kind of the, one of the interesting things about you know with spay casting because you can do a really crappy cast and still fish you know <laughs> fish the swing you know with the after the big men and you get your fly in the zone i mean but you know it, there's something about having you know a tight loop or whatever you want to call it, just that cast that feels good and you know, I think a lot of people, I don't know, it seems like there's a, a little bit of a, you know, a, a big curve there between where you're just getting it out versus you getting that line out that just feels like, you know, you're watching, you know, you or whoever, what other, other pro is out there casting. Um, so, yeah, I guess that that's, I was just thinking of a couple other, you know, one of the things, the, the fulcrum, right? I mean, that's, the, that's a big part of it. I know that's something that I've struggled with just where you feel like you want to use that upper hand to do like almost a single hand cast you know you're doing too much of that versus using your that hand as kind of the fulcrum and then you know using your lower hand to actually shoot out the line is that something you see as a as a kind of a pain point with a lot of people or is that pretty easy to teach well i i think that it's a very relevant point in that um and I, I'd like to bring in, uh, you know, another, I guess, a variable into that, that, you know, if the fulcrum is, as you said, you know, if that upper hand works and it does, the upper hand works well as a fulcrum, uh, you know, would you feel as if, if you had a different weight at the lever end of that fulcrum, that it might yeah. change what that fulcrum That's, feels? It totally, completely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so the balance of a setup, um, is important to me yeah. that, you know, especially when you start out, you, you know, everybody has their real preferences, you know, as they get into the game. Um, but before they develop any kind of preference, I like to at least introduce the concept that, you know, if you want, if you want to you best utilize the fulcrum for what it's best, you know, here is a way to make it so that there is the least amount of bias mm. in either direction mm -hmm. of that fulcrum. Right. Right. And, you know, this is something, boy, I mean, who talks about this? Um, Mel Krieger mm. even talked about this in single hand casting or, you know, you can go back to Vince Marinero talking about this as far as the weight of the reel in relevant to how a rod feels in hand. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so that if you have, you know, a reel that's too heavy or too light, you're going to have some effect on how the rod feels. Yeah. So so being intentional uh, you know, again, here's the intentional decision making that being intentional with your choice of what you want, you know, can affect your experience and what you want to get out of your angling, you know, your time on the water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I was, uh, yeah, I was just thinking of the conversation. I think it was Jack Mitchell who was mentioning when we were chatting about how he was using, oh, I can't remember. He was using a rod. I think it was a sage. I can't remember which one, seven weight. And, um, he just didn't have the right line on there for a long time. And then finally somebody said, why don't you try this? I think it was a shorter line and he put it on there. It was like, boom, you know, this thing is sweet. So, it, I mean, I guess not only the reel, but having, you know, the right law, uh, the right line for the rod is also kind of another factor. Do you, do you see that as a fact? I mean, you mentioned that kind of that five ten, you know, Skagit head, but do you think there's a lot of variation between the kind of the ins and outs of the lines or is that not something to really worry about early? Oh my God, that that is the factor. Okay, right. there you <laughs> and, go. Uh, Jack and I are very good friends. I love that guy. Yeah, and, you know, I, I would say that the fact that he kept that same line on there with that rod is is, is very much his personality. I know. I'm going to make this work. So that, that's how I am too. I know. I know how where he's coming from. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember, you know, Jack and I reconnecting. Um, over, I mean, we've, we've fished around each other for many, many years and, you know, but it wasn't until probably the last, you know, five to seven years that we became good friends and started fishing together actually. And we've shared a lot of great conversations on the water in relation to, you know, rod and line relationship that it is that pairing. And I use that word, that pairing yeah. is, is crucial 
to what it is that you want to do that, you know, sure, a rod is a simple lever that just deflects. But within that deflection, there are going to be certain characteristics that may or may not play to what you want to do. So, you know, some rods I like, I find that are phenomenal at lifting sink tips out of the water. Then some rods have really light tips. Mm. So they allow like a really short and compact stroke that, you know, you can accelerate to a stop and the rod just, it comes right back, comes to life. So I feel that, and, and after working with designers of rods, I, I find that, you know, they have a particular intention when they design a rod that they want, like they envision the rod in its happy place. Right. Yeah. And, you know, oftentimes it's involved, you know, in the water. But that relationship of line and rod will also play into how happy that rod is doing what it's doing. Yeah. You know, without putting any you know rod in particular box. That was one of the fun things I got for, you know, doing the reviews for the first couple of years of Steelheaders Journal was I got to really intimately, uh, I guess, define the idiosyncrasies of every different rod. And we we used a control of one Skagit line and one Scandi mm-hmm. line, depending on the grain weights. Mm-hmm. But the purpose of that was to, I guess, divulge some of the differences. Yeah. And boy, it can be very small, but oftentimes, you know, also very obvious. Yeah. The differences between a seven weight, like a thirteen foot seven weight, from another thirteen foot seven mm-hmm. weight. And you, you know, and you guys went so, through uh, and looked at a bunch of different uh, brands, uh, d- different brands of rods for that. Yeah, if I remember right, like 19. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> so you covered uh, both kind of low end. I know you've done some work with Thomas and Thomas and, and some of the, uh, some stuff there, but both kind of low end and upper end rod as far as prices and things like that. Absolutely. I, I mean, I feel that is mandatory yeah. that, you know, in this day and age, it is it's so nice to be able to tell a beginning angler that they can get into the game with rod, real line and everything for under 500 bucks. Yeah. You know, and, you know, I know there's a couple other companies out there coming out with with spay rods sub 300. Right. And, and so to me, that is huge because it just that I don't know. Huge. I mean, when you yeah. drop the bomb of, yeah, this is going to cost you a grand. Yeah, a grand is a different cha- It's a game changer. Jeez. I know. I mean, it, it not only and I, you know, it's my involvement with, you know, with also education has led me to, you know, to the importance of diversity. And, you know, being able to get more anglers on the water so that we can cultivate more, more, I guess, people that want to protect the resource. Yeah. You know, advocates oh, yeah. is the word. Yep. And so the more advocates we get, the better it is. And sure, that means more anglers on the water. But that also also means there's more people fighting for the resource. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I mean, if you, more people. But. Yeah, regardless, I think in the long run, the more people that are fishing, the the more people that are going to protect and get the word out to protect the resource. So, yeah, it's kind of a, uh, you know, I don't know if it's a double-edged sword, but it kind of goes both ways. Um, so would you, I'm not sure, you know, I know you've you've worked with some other different companies. Can you maybe give us a, um, you know, a recommendation on, on one of those rods that are set up in the $500 range? Are there any, is that is that something you, you can do or... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I would say that there's really – find what works for you. I mean there's lots of rods in the sub-$500 range. Yeah. I mean you've got Echo, Reddington, you know, Beulah, all these rods yeah. that are – you know, that will do the job. Find one that 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 I guess talks to you. Yeah. You know, find one that says I like the way that rod looks. Mm-hmm. I like the way, you know, it fits into my budget. I, you know, I, when I pick it up even because I, I, I mean, I get a lot of beginning anglers to pick up a rod, wiggle it, and they don't even know what they're looking yeah, for. You know? right. But it's kind of cool to see that that may or may not matter. You yeah. know, that they, they pick it up, they wiggle it and say, okay, that, that feels light in hand or, you know, that is really soft. Right. Um, it, who knows what that means? You know, I was definitely there. Um, but find something that appeals to you, find something that you are not going to regret purchasing. Um, because I, I hear that, you know, in the world of social media, we're just, we're flogged with FOMO, like fear of missing out. And, you know, you get these people that see a rod, you know, Rex to a nice fish and, oh, I need to upgrade my rod, but they, you know, they're still, they're still learning how to cast. Yeah. And I would just encourage people to, you know, put your money in, put your money elsewhere. I don't know, put it into something else, but just. Don't don't waste your money trying to upgrade. Just take your time, learn the resource, appreciate it, and 
and, and really spend the time on the water because that's where I find the magic happens. Yeah. You know, you can we can sit at our desk all day and buy gear, but you know, time is the is the shortage I find that we have the hardest time making. Right. Uh, and you know, when it comes to when it comes to equipment, there's I haven't seen bad equipment out there, and I've I've said this before that there's very few bad rods, but just bad rod and line combinations. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. No, that's a great, great port, uh, point to remember. Um, I was thinking about you mentioned a couple of names as we were going to some old, old time uh, people here and stuff like that. Is there anybody looking at your history as far as uh, mentors and things you've had, you know, going throughout your fly fishing career? Anybody that you know sticks out you you want to notice? Somebody that's kind of helped get you to to where you are? Oh my God, of course. You know, we, we wouldn't be here without mentorship. And, you know, whatever that might mean, whether it's even an angler or not, you know, maybe someone that offered a perspective through our journey. Um, but, you know, in the fly fishing industry, I would say my I, I, Jack Charlton mm. of Charlton Reels, you know, he's the late Jack Charlton. He's, mm-hmm. He was a good friend. And, you know, I would say that he he made the first impression on me of, of leading by example. And, and that was, I would say that was right around, you know, probably, Oh gosh, I was back from, I was back from college. So like, Oh two, Hmm. Oh three, right around there. And, um, I remember, I remember because I was working at a fly shop. I remember seeing his reels on the pro form and they were still $900 (laughs) on the pro form. And, and, And thinking, I'm like, what is so special about these reels? Yeah. And, you know, I had a friend up north, uh, another mentor who I'll get to in a minute. His name is mm-hmm. Harry Huff. And, you know, Harry's an old he's an old timer. He was big into the two-handed game with Atlantic Salmon. He was the first person to put a two-handed rod in my hands. Mm. Um, but uh, but when I came to visit, he, he recommended me to Jack Charlton. And, you know, some college punk kid, you know, I, I must have been, I don't know, 19, 20 at yeah. the time, um, decided to call him up and say, hey, Jack, I want to learn a little bit more about what you do. And he not only just said, okay, come on up, but he took the entire day off. He took the entire day off of work to show this kid what he did. And he led me through the entire process from bar stock aluminum to hand polished type three anodized. Hmm. And it wasn't, I mean, (laughs) I remember I was just, just mind blown by the technicalities of, of what he did to create such a, I don't want to use the word perfect, but it's the closest example of perfection I've seen, you know, hmm. when it comes to effort and just the end result product. But I mean, the Charlton reel is, it's just a, it's a tangible, it's a tangible version of what he puts into it. Hmm. And I got to see that. I got to meet Judy. We became good friends, Jack and Judy and I, and you know, I got to see him a couple of times throughout the year, but you know, after at the end of the day, he brought me out and bought me a hamburger, <laughs> you know, for, for a college kid, it's like free That's huge. food. Yeah. I got to learn about fly fishing. I got to learn, you know, from somebody who's really good at what they do. Huh. And from that point forward, I feel that, you know, I, I was tasked with the obligation to, to lead by example. Yeah. And, and that was, that was what he did for me. So that was That's cool. a very, yeah, a very big thing. And, you know, I would say that I, I have, I have one. I have one Charlton that was mm-hmm. that was a very very gracious gift from a good friend, mm-hmm. um, and uh, you know it's it's the eighty five hundred point eight, and it was it was dinged up, it was used, it was it was perfect, it was exactly what uh, you know. So I didn't I, I didn't I didn't feel bad fishing it, mm-hmm. and and so I, I fish it on my thirteen foot seven weight. Cool. Uh, it's my thirteen oh seven TNT, and um, and that is that's like my that's my sacred setup. But I mean I that setup has some serious karma. Like yeah. the people that I've put that rod in the hands of have caught some pretty notable fish. <laughs> and it, it, it's just I believe in that. That you know, there's there's definitely a soul to that setup. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. No, that's really cool. I'll uh yeah, I'll uh, provide some more uh, links like I noted earlier to uh some of these uh things we're talking about here. Um You've done a little bit of um, kind of gotten into the trout uh, space side of it. Is is that true? And it, can you maybe clarify a little bit about just where you think that's going in the industry as far as, you know, spay rods for trout or maybe even talk about switch rods and, and that whole thing? Absolutely. I feel that, the you know, back to the facts is that there are probably more trout on this planet than steelhead. Yep. 
So <laughs> yeah, a lot more. <laughs> so, so, so that being said, I feel that in regards to the two handed game, that there is certainly more potential for rods in anglers' hands to get out and experience, you know, what what could be everything from a new perspective of casting to a new cha- a new challenge to just you know another facet of their you know their angling repertoire. Mm-hmm. So I, I feel the trout game is is relevant. I feel it's growing. Um, you know, I've I've done a few talks on my experience in in swinging flies for trout. Um, I feel that. Um, the, the number one skill set that I, you know, that I instruct and both, you know, both try to hone every time I go fish a new fishery is that of empathy. You know, how do you understand the, your target, you know, you, you, how, what you're trying to communicate with. And, you know, that being said, where do they hold? So reading water to me right. is, is the big thing. Yeah. And I find that, you know, a lot of steelhead anglers, uh, when when given a trout stream, you know, and a white marker, you know, shot from a drone from above, would would circle particular holding kinds of water. Um, but what I've also found is that you know, a trout or fish in general, they're not very tall, right? Um, my my buddy my buddy Joe, who's uh, six six, says that. Yeah, I think it's um, who's maybe you know to me who's five six. Right. Um, but uh, <laughs> we we laugh about yeah, fish are not very tall. Yeah, which means that, you know, for trout, they don't really have to be in the you know three to six feet of walking pace holding water that you know sometimes they're in a foot of water yeah and um i have def in my experience you know fishing flies um with a swung presentation have found that sometimes you might have to strip the fly you know god forbid that you don't mm-hmm. just swing the fly mm-hmm. that you might strip the fly um and and fish a fly like don't forget to fish your fly right and you know with intention and and I find that uh, the the rods and the lines are starting to, you know, they've definitely exploded. So in a similar in a similar tone, that to not overcomplicate things, find the water where you want to swing flies for trout, and decide whether or not a two handed rod is even feasible mm-hmm. for what you want, or maybe a single hander, you know, nine foot, nine and a half foot, five weight. Boy, that would be a, a rad small water yeah. swings, and. Um, but you know, I think that that is, that's definitely, it's, it's on the growth and you know, it has legs, mm-hmm. if you will. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the number of trout anglers that are able to experience, um, the mental approach of swinging a fly. And you know, that that's, you know, that's another can of worms, but I find that yeah. when you swing a fly versus target a feeding fish that you, it would be in your better interest to accept what's happening. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, and, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, that, you know, th- that being subjecting yourself to free will, right? Mm-hmm. And, and that, you know, if you're, if you're swinging a fly, especially if you're not stripping it, you, you're literally, you know, putting your offering out there through the water that would best hold a fish and, and waiting, you know, waiting for a fish to react versus seeing a fish continue to feed yeah. and, you know, and, and try to dial in what may or may not be right or wrong. Mm hmm. Yeah, dig, digging into it a little bit deeper. That's, I guess, even with uh, swinging for steelhead, it, it's uh, it's pretty you know it's pretty simple. But there are some little things you can do throughout, you know, the way you fish and you know the way you find fish. You, you mentioned um, reading water. Do you have um, that's you know definitely a point of oh you know always a, a struggle for people. Do you have any any tips that you think about whether it's trout or steelhead when you're trying to find the fish or you know any recommendations there absolutely absolutely great question i i feel that you know the the number two right behind that that very first skill set to an angler of of empathy of, of being able to read the water is presentation mm-hmm. um and you know for your presentation it it'll depend you know if, if you feel as if that you're fishing through slow water and you want to you know, soak your fly in that marination station as long as you want, then, you know, ad- address your presentation as such. But, you know, if you're trying to, you know, we'll just paint the picture of if you're in a riffle on the Deschutes and the water temp is, you know, 60. Yeah. And and you you know that through previous data points that they might be up in those riffles that you might want to speed up that presentation to elicit a response. It's like the mm. chase response from a dog. Mm-hmm. You know, is 
um, the presentation through the water, the kind of water that they're going to be for every species, it's going to be different, you know, per day. Yeah. And but what I would suggest, you know, recommend people do is I, I say this with my with my daughter. If you were a fish, where would you be and why? Yeah. And and that's that's a simple question. And so long as you have a reason for that, you know, you can have the most crazy answer. But so long as you have a reason for that, I feel as if that contributes to our angling experience um, such that you go out with intent and you don't leave the water feeling like you have done nothing. Yeah. Yeah. You're actually thinking a little bit out there. You bet. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I was, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that is the cool thing about, you know, like you said, I think at the beginning with fly fishing, I mean, you were always out there, you know, it's, it's a learning process and, you know, you've got to be, it's like, I always think of like, put your lab coat on and, you know, kind of test your hypothesis or whatever, you know, it's, it's like, we should all be doing that. I think sometimes you get stuck with the information, you know, looking online, you're like, well, you know, read this and that's the, the answer, but really it's not the answer experience is the answer right it it, it is um i, I have uh, a good friend that uh manages a fly shop in, in seattle and and we talk a lot about that that uh you know when people go out there and you know they they do things because they're told to um it, i feel as if it takes away from that that learning experience and far be it from me to to rob somebody of that awakening of of something whatever yeah. that might be yeah you know um but, you know, if you go out there and you learn something new, I mean, that's, I think that my dad said that as you know, when I was a kid was make sure you learn something new every day. Yep. And I mean, if you do that, then sure, you know, then I, I feel as if that, that's a goal of mine every time I go out yep. that, you know, I, I learn so much in between fish mm-hmm. and, you know, when I catch a fish, yeah, I learn a thing or two, of course. Um, but what I learn around that, like I, I shoot, I learned to communicate with Canadian geese the other day hmm. and it was, you know, it was funny. They're just sitting there at the top of the run, sitting on their rock. And, you know, I, I remember every time they come up to you, you know how they bob their head mm-hmm. and I, I wasn't sure what that meant. So I started bobbing my head <laughs> and just looking and, you know, then they, they continued doing it and I, I'm not sure what it was, but it was just like, Oh, okay. So this weird looking duck is now bobbing its head at us. <laughs> Um, or, uh, you know, goose, whatever. But I, yeah. it was just funny that that kind of communication was, that's what I learned. It's yeah. like, okay, I'm going to start acting like them and see what they do. Totally. You know? Totally. We're, uh, yeah, we're, I, yeah. I've seen what happens when I walk up on them with a spay rod. You know, <laughs> yeah. they, they start hissing and flapping their wings and, you know, I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't look like they're happy. Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> totally. We're all, we're all animals and that's the, yeah. Right. F- fish are the same way. If you, if you jump in the water with them, they're not quite as uh, hesitant to run away from you. But if you're up above, you're a predator. So I guess you gotta you gotta meet them in their in their comfort zone is, is maybe the answer. You bet. Yeah, and it's that's the thing is I when I go fishing, I I like to say I'm looking for what's looking for me. Yeah. You know, it's like I I don't know every fly, every day I don't choose my fly to like get to the water, which is that that's the third mm-hmm. thing is mm-hmm. the fly. Yeah. Is, you know, the first thing being water selection and empathy, you know, reading the water. Second being presentation and what you do with your, you know, your presentation. Mm-hmm. And third, tertiary is, is then fly choice. You know, I feel, yeah, it's relevant. But, yeah, you know, I, I, if you're throwing through water that there's no fish in, <laughs> right. then, then your success rate may be different. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, that's, that's huge. Um, and we talked about the rip city, uh, earlier, but do you have, uh, maybe a couple other patterns that you, you know, you like to use most often for, oh. yeah, for steelhead? Oh, you know, I, I love flies. I love the creation of flies. You know, there's, I, I was just asked, um, you know, my, my favorite article that I've written, um, by, by Pat over at Steelheaders Journal is, mm-hmm. um, he asked me to write something about how my flies came to be. And yeah, sure. I, you know, um, reviewing rods, understanding lines, miking out lines, all that technical stuff is very pleasing to my brain for whatever reason. Um, but I feel that being asked to put emphasis on the journey was a whole different perspective because there's a story for every single fly. And, yeah. you know, yeah, there's, there's quite a few patterns out there. You know, I, I've always I've always been fascinated with muddler heads. I mean, mm-hmm. Don Gapen's muddler head is 
that that's something that I, I'm also seeing quite a bit of on social media these days. It seems like the craze has gotten out. Oh yeah. Um, but I mean, when my buddy Matt showed me this muddler that he tied, and it was a fly his buddy Nile tied actually a big, huge muddler that he was swinging for steelhead. It's like wow, that thing must get housed. <laughs> and you know, and the first time I fished it, it was like yeah, this grab was savage. Hmm. You know, it's like it wanted to kill the damn thing. Yep. And th- th- that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> and so. Mm-hmm. You know, so I started applying that to, you know, just other patterns and creating different color variation sizes. Um, I personally like flies that can be casted. Yeah. <laughs> I know that sounds kind of funny, but, you know, when, I, when I've when i seen the gigantic flies, you know, going through the phase of how big of a fly I can catch a right, fish on. Right, Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. You know, tying them was fun because there was no wrong. Yeah. Uh- there was just... You could go through a whole package of flash, you know, and then, you know, then you've got all these flies that, you know, how much flash can you put on a fly before, you know, you might as well just throw, you know, a little Cleo out there. Yeah, right. And, and um, but that whole process is just as awakening that the creation, the creative process um, of fly tying, you know, everything from mothers. I, I have a couple other patterns, you know, that look like shrimp, mm-hmm. um, some, you know, that look like woolly buggers. It's just that size of between two and a half to three inches yep. is a very castable one. You it know, is. even in the muddler format where it does push a lot of water, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it can still get out there, get out of the water, fly through the water, fly through the air fine, and present in a way that gives us the confidence that we're actually throwing something that a fish might react to. Yeah. Yeah, no, that is uh... – those are all uh, good tips on the fly. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not. There's not one fly that's gonna that's gonna do. And that's what kind of makes it fun is that the wet fly. Yeah, the wet fly. <laughs> the wet fly swing. Yeah. The wet fly works better um, in the if it's in the water. I mean, even if it's a dry fly, but it's uh, yeah. Yeah, a dry fly that's wet still yeah. works better. <laughs> do you do, do you do much um, uh, is equal amount of? Well, I guess you're kind of more around winter steelhead, but uh, you do some summer steelhead fishing as well. Oh God. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's being in the Portland area, it's a year round thing. Yeah. I mean, I, my, 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 um, my gripes really don't fall on many sympathetic ears when I say that I am sick and tired of swinging flies for steelhead <laughs> because it's all we do out here. Mm-hmm. And, but you know, it's just kind of jokingly said because I love the process and, um, the process is really what gets me out the door, whether it be summer steelhead or winter steelhead. Yeah, winter steelhead is, is a different game. It's braving the elements, you know, but summer summer fishing is wet waiting. I mean, oh, yeah. it's like fishing in your swim trunks and chacos and, and catching fish that are, you know, that <laughs> are, you know, arguably more more active and willing to take, a, you know, a fly. Mm-hmm. But it's a year round thing. I mean, I like sitting where I am right now, I am 12 minutes from one of my largest swung fish I've ever caught. Hmm. And, you know, to be able to do that in the summer or the winter or, you know, in the seasons in between, like we are right now, these shoulder seasons are some of my favorite times because, you know, I can, I can give half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour at a time. And I don't have to commit all day, but I can get the data points from where I feel that fish are going to be. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I can do that, you know, multiple times a week without really taking too much away from my priorities to my family. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. With a six year old, uh, you said you have a one, uh, six year old kid, right? Yes. Daughter. I have a six year old daughter, one, one child for now. And, um, and I have a puppy named drift. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, the kids definitely, well, I guess six years old, she's probably, uh, almost ready to start thinking maybe not steelhead quite yet but uh probably not too far off right are, are you uh, getting excited about all that well I, I would say that with you know as 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 a crazed angler of of myself i she's been on the water quite a bit you know whether or not she wanted to earlier on it was like all right you are portable still right. for a little bit that was some good advice that i got from some friends yeah. was before they learn how to argue get them out get there. them out you know, and, and I did, you know, I bundled yeah. her up threw her in my backpack. Um, mm-hmm. the, uh, Marty and Mia Shepard were kind enough to give us the backpack that they had with Tegan. And, oh, yeah. you know, we had this, you know, my, my daughter got the, the mezzanine view from over my shoulders for, for quite a few fish nice. and she got to see the process. So that way, yeah, sure. Now when she's in kindergarten, she has other things that she wants to do. You know, I don't look back and regret that I didn't take my daughter fishing, nor do I have to fight her to say, hey, you know, you're going fishing. And then 
drag her out the door crying. I don't want that. Yeah. It's, you know, it's something that I want her to know that exists, that she has been there for, that, you know, will hopefully be a part in her life at some point, but she doesn't feel obligated to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Giving her the, well, I think that goes with anything. I mean, or just introduce them to as much stuff as you can, right? And just let them see what, what they get into and and keep them busy. And <laughs> it's probably probably about as good as you can do getting them started. Absolutely. I mean, she loves tying flies. I nice. mean, she has, I gave her my old vice, sits underneath her bunk bed. Yep. And, you know, every every single one comes out pink, um, regardless yeah. if we start out whatever color. But, hey, I have – I mean, those are the flies that I have the utmost confidence in is, you know, one that was created with good intent. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah, so uh, we're getting uh, pretty close here, Brian, to wrapping this thing up. I got a few more – a couple – few more questions here. Um, one thing I was saying, we talked um, – definitely talked about reels and balance and rods and – lines and things like that as far as the leader any any secrets there or tips or as far as a you know leader usually used for steelhead you build your own or you just put on a kind of a straight leader what, what do you do there and, and do you use uh, ever use two flies yeah yeah i think yes to those you know all the questions yeah. i guess <laughs> yeah um but you know leader length is i would whatever i would i'm going to defer to consistency that um that if you have a leader length that you that you like stick with it. I mean, for me, oftentimes it's about five feet long, Mm -hmm. four and a half to five feet long. And, you know, I typically use 12 or 15 pound pound fluorocarbon. Mm -hmm. Just, I don't know. Cause it's, I I found a a cigar red label fluorocarbon. That's, you know, that's more affordable, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I know I've went through a Maxima phase that works great. Yeah. Um, but I'm not too picky about that. So long as it, the one thing I am picky about though is changing it out. Yeah, is is that, you know, after I, you know, I when I come back home, I'm not talking I change it out when I get home. But before I go fishing again, mm-hmm. I um, I make sure and it also helps to reduce the waste on the river. You know, I I can change it out at home and I can recycle it. Right. Um, I can throw it in the plastic recycle bin and it doesn't end up, you know, in, I don't know, it's in the river somewhere mm-hmm. for the next 90 years. Um, and, and so um, and, and, you know, this kind of brings me to a point that it's a little funny thing that I do. We all have our little little things that we do are are superstitions, I guess. Yeah. Um, but I, I carry like an old little jam jar. Um, that's it's, I just call it the karma jar. It was, you know, it sits on the side of my backpack that I carry. And so that way I can put the scraps in there. But a fun thing that I do is I just keep filling the thing, um, until I catch a fish of note, you know, either I'm part of a, you know, a fish of note, whether my buddy catches it or I catch Mm it and then it gets emptied. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's funny because sometimes Holy heck, that thing gets crammed. I mean, I can't fit much more in there. You know, there's, but occasionally, occasionally, like this, this fall, I mean, there was a time when not any trash even made it in there. Yeah. You know, so there's, there's those moments, but it's just a fun way of, of when you empty it out to say, okay, well, this is how much, you know, intentional, good, good intention making was necessary for this (laughs) return of favor from, from, you know, from nature. (laughs) Yeah. Cool. So, yeah, and it's just a you know a way of keeping the resource as it is, and you know if not in a better place, than you know before you got there. Nice. So nice. Um, so uh, we talked a little bit before we got on here today about the um, uh, Soul River runs deep. Um, can you um, explain maybe a little bit about that um, that whole project or program and, and how you fit into it? Oh man, that's uh, I'll try to keep yeah. this within a couple sentences. Yeah, totally. <laughs> But what it started out as was just was being there for a friend. That's all it started out as was Mm -hmm. I had my buddy Chad that I I literally met on the water um, in in a short but hilarious story. I I, he was hooked on to a Chinook that charged him in the river and he thought that it was going to eat him. Ah. And so, you know, and I, I walk up right about the point in which he's running away oh. from a fish that's running up a riffle, <laughs> um, as you know, as they sometimes do. Yeah. But uh, I remember his words were that his, their teeth are so white when they, <laughs> when they come upstream. Um, but that was, that was our first interaction. And, you know, I, I got to see this, you know, this, this big African American dude running up river with a fly rod in hand attached to this, you know, 10, 15 pound snook. Huh. And so, um, we were friends after that. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, and after that, you know, I just kept on running into him places. And one of those things that, 
you realize that this is not coincidental. So, yeah. you know, we, he took a couple lessons and, you know, I taught him, he asked, he said, Hey, you know, I'm learning how to do this spay casting thing. Do you know how? And so I said, sure, I can help. Um, so we fished together. We got to know each other. Well, he went through some really dark times as a, you know, as, as a combat veteran. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that, that come up, you know, behind, behind the, behind the, I guess what you see. And, you know, he, he had a really dark moment in which uh, he was fortunate he was able to pull it together and, and come together and, and, I guess, pull through. And at that point, he was on the river. And so he says that he found his soul <laughs> in the river <laughs> at that moment. And so, um, so he pulled through from there. And, you know, from that point forward, from that, you know, deepest, darkest low, um, he was able to pull forward. And from that point forward, has, has kept taking steps to – to I guess to feel his vision of being able to share the power of what fly fishing has had on his life um, as a veteran, hmm. as a troubled youth, and that's what the that's what the organization focuses around is being able to help show veterans and and troubled youth how you know what it is that we see and and to see as to whether or not you know we're not we're not tied to the outcome that sure we bring these you know we bring these kids out to the outdoors some of them like it some of them don't but. For the ones that do, if we can just impact one life, just one, right? that hopefully we can create an advocate for our resources. And, you know, that's the thing. I, I said that earlier about how if the whole reason that I was shown how to fish or that that gear turned when I was five years old on that dock was to help Chad. I mean, I'm, I'm good with that. Yeah, totally. Wow. Yeah, that sounds like it definitely deep. Deep is a uh, good uh, way to think about that. I, I was trying to think of a couple other organizations. Um, there's definitely s- some similar groups around the country that are um, doing similar things. Some people I haven't really been involved in, but um, it sounds like you guys pretty much have your own. Um, y- you don't really connect with, or do you connect with other groups that are doing similar things as far as veterans and you know fishing and that sort of thing? Well, absolutely. I mean, we, it's it's um, it's based around collaboration. Like we could not do this alone. I mean, we just we just had a team building board meeting that we had um, just on the focus of, of diversity and leadership and what we do in the outdoors. Uh, it was hosted by Knowles. I mean, it was just oh, yeah. it was. Yeah. I mean, we work with other organizations to be able to help further the mission of, you know, of awareness and, you know, to share what we see, the beauty of, of the natural and the connection with that. And and so, you know, those those are those are awesome events. You know, they, you never know what can come out of them. And, you know, I feel that in, you know, in conjunction, like we've, we've worked with Sam's, we've worked with Orvis, we've worked with Patagonia. I mean, there's, there's all these companies that what I have found is are are amazing because the number of people that want to help and join the mission has really been an uplift in, you know, in humanity, in the industry, Hmm. in, in seeing that, you know, the people believe in something good that, you know, amidst all the, you know, all the bad stuff out there, that there are quite a few people that want to stand up for what's right. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That's definitely some powerful stuff. Um, Cool, Brian. Well, I'm uh, about there. I wanted to check in with you and see if there's, um, you know, in the next maybe six months, do you have anything uh, new upcoming you want to, you know, let anybody know here or um, kind of uh, maybe what you have going in the next six months to a year? as far as, you know, fly fishing or anything we can look to expect for, you know, see you out in the river or whatever? Well, you know, I'm, I'm often on the river most of the time during the weekdays. Okay. I gotta say that, uh, you know, if, uh, if I can, you know, while my daughter's at school, I'll duck out for a couple hours here and there. Nice. Um, but I, I would say that to get, just to get involved in the community because the community is, is really what I feel keeps this going because, it, you know, fly fishing is kind of a solitary thing. You, yeah. know, you go out there, you do it on your own. Sometimes I don't feel like calling any of my buddies. I just want to get out there, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but some of the most memorable times I've had that have at least been documented, you know, in photography, it's another one of my passions, mm. uh, maybe for another time. But, yeah. uh, you know, to be able to share these moments with your friends, you know, to land a fish for your buddy that, you know, that's going through a tough time in his life. And, you know, th- that sort of stuff is just just to get out there, go fishing with your friends, take your friends fishing, teach somebody how to fish and, you know, at least expose them to what this is. And I feel that those, you know, the events like where, where you and I connected, you know, at the click yeah. attack, yeah. get that one on the calendar, get the Sandy Clave on the calendar, yeah. wherever's closest to you, 
find out where those closest community events are, meet some people, get connected and, and just go fishing, get out there. Yeah, definitely. No, it's a good, uh, good call to action there. Cool. Uh, so I think uh, we're good to go. Did I uh, miss anything, uh, anything else you want to throw out there that, uh, you know, we didn't cover today? Oh man. You know, I thank you for the questions. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, you know, this is exactly, you know, this fuels my fire to be able to keep doing what I do. And, you know, I just, I love seeing people that, uh, that care. They yeah. actually, you know, <laughs> yeah. they give a damn. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. I think that's the crazy thing at this time and day and age where there's all sorts of craziness going on with politics and everything else. It's like, you know, there's still a lot of awesome people out there. And I think that's, you know, hopefully, you know, my, my show here, this, this is going to help connect some of those people and, you know, I think the stories that you told there are pretty, pretty awesome because I think if I think about the, you know, kind of a, the, the arc of this, this show we've had here today, I think it's all about connecting, right? Whether that's with the river people. And so I think that's, that's a great message to have. So, um, cool, Brian. Well, uh, do you want to leave, uh, maybe one spot where, you know, people can get a hold of you or connect with you? Well, I mean, there's a couple ways, you know, via email, just go to, go to the, I mean, the Thomas and Thomas website has, has my contact information. Um, soul river, soul river, okay. uh, runs deep, I think has my contact information. Yep. Um, but you know, connect with me on Facebook too. Just look me up on Facebook and, uh, yeah, I, I'd be happy to communicate with that. Let's just start, let's start talking, find out what it is that you want. Um, and, uh, you know, whether it be a lesson, just advice on lines, I get a lot of questions on lines, yeah. you know, from, from guys that I've never met. And I love talking to these guys, you know, a lot of them are, you know, retired, sitting at home, just over reading yep. the internet. Right. And you know, I get these elaborate questions <laughs> about, you know, 10 different lines that they have researched, but that have never casted. Um, yep. but you know, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I like talking about that. I like sharing what it is that we do and, um, you know, and helping people reach out and enjoy what we have. So yeah, I would say through TNT or through soul river, um, that's probably the best or Facebook, you know, that's a great yeah. way. Instagram as well. I'm on Instagram as well. Okay. So. Perfect. All right, Brian. Well, thanks a lot for uh, coming on and spend the time and I'll, uh, hopefully look forward to uh, seeing you on the river soon. Thank you very much, Dave. I appreciate the opportunity. Okay, we'll see ya. All right. Bye. So there you have it. If you want to find Brian, go to soulriverrunsdeep.com. And if you want to check out the show notes for this episode, go to wetflyswing.com and search for Brian Chow. If you found this episode helpful in any way, please subscribe on YouTube. That would be super awesome. And I uh, just want to say thanks again for checking out the show today and hope to see you very soon on the river. I'll catch you all on the flip side. <laughs>